Amen. Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon, Paul. It's um, um, like Erica was saying, it's amazing. You know, from probably two weeks ago, it was freezing cold, and now it's burning hot. <laughs> but it's, I'm glad that you're we have AC, so you should be okay. You shouldn't be, you know, dying out there. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, uh, I'm excited to be here and to share just what's been on my heart this afternoon. Um, I will be in Brampton this morning just talking about Jesus. And even, even last week, I believe Pastor Roy preached here. Um, and uh, same thing, talking about, you know, our, our, the faith, our faith in Christ. And, and even endure, our enduring faith, even in uh, hard times. And this, you know, it got me really thinking, even from last week and even prior to that, about uh, just the theme of, in this world, we're just facing different times. Um, you know, I have the privilege of working with a lot of young people, and then I've noticed that even through the things that they're facing now are completely different than I, the things that I were facing. I always talk to you, Alex and Maricar, we always kind of compare notes when we're dealing with the young people. And we notice so drastically that the things that were relevant in their day and the issues and things, um, even in, in my day, you know, are not the same things that is happening now. And you can see that the times are getting a little bit darker and it's what the Bible says. That, you know, there's, that, that in, in, in the Bible when it talks about, you know, there's rumors of wars, things like that. There's things that it's getting darker and darker. But what I love about being a Christian is knowing that we always have hope. And, and what, even though the times are changing, Jesus never changed. And he's our hope of glory. Amen. Everything we can anchor on him. That's what gets me excited to still live <laughs> and uh, face everyday life because of Jesus. And... Today, I want to be able to share with you and ask you some real questions, um, you know, about really who Jesus is to each and one, every one of you. Um, you know, we, we talk about maybe if you've come here and you've been to our celebration <laughs> services, even in Scarborough, you've been to the life groups, you know, you'll hear about Jesus, maybe a lot about maturity and walking in our Christian faith with God. But I really want to focus in on really who Jesus is. How valuable is Jesus to each and every one of you? It's a question to ask ourselves. You know, if, if Jesus, if I put it in this way, if Jesus were not allowed to be in your life, how would your life change? It just shows you the, the real picture of how Jesus, how much Jesus is important to you. For, for example, if Jesus was not allowed to be in your life, would you, would it just, your life simply just change because maybe in Saturday, Sunday afternoons you would be free now. You didn't have to come here to the celebration service or your life group leader would not be always following you up and telling you to join the life group or to attend this church event or this conference. If Jesus were not a part of your life, how would things be different? It just shows us to see how important Jesus uh, uh, in our everyday life, Jesus really is. Um, even if we look at scripture, the scripture that we're going to look at today, we're going to look at Apostle Paul and how he counted Jesus and how um, he valued his worth in his life. We're going to look um, to Philippians 3. Let's turn there, uh, 4 to Philippians 3, verse 4 to 13. And this is Paul speaking. We're going to read the entire thing. I know it's a little bit longer, um, but we'll read it through. So starting from verse 4, this is Paul talking. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I 
consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes. To know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Verse 11, and so on, somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straight towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's, let's just pray. Father God, we just thank you for this time where we have the opportunity to hear from you. God, I thank you that you are a God who speaks and who's alive today. God, I pray that you would speak forth your word with clarity and truth, that it would impact our lives in a way like it's never done before. Because God, you want us to leave here transformed and changed. Lord, I pray for every heart and every mind that we would be good ground and good soil to receive what you're speaking to us. God, I pray that you would remove every distraction and every hindering spirit that we could encounter you in a fresh way today. Holy Spirit, do your unique work in each and every one. Miss encounter you and let you alone have all the glory. In Jesus, my name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, when we look at this word, it's it's a familiar passage that maybe you've seen quote, uh, quoted before. Maybe you have it on your, you know, your mirror or your desktop. You know, I press on, straight towards the goal, just to remind you. And, you know, what I love about this is Paul makes a, a comparison here to give us a picture of the worth and value of knowing Christ Jesus. He mentions that all that which holds value to him, or even the all that would desirable to other people, he counts it all as loss. And in, in verses five to six, it, it, it talks about this in the, in, in the chapter, and it says he was Paul was the one he was circumcised on the eighth day. So it, that was the day, the very day that God actually appointed that to be circumcised. So he was in accordance to that. The covenant was there. All those things of the people of Israel. He he said he was a peop of the people of Israel. So he was a native Israelite. He had all the birthright privileges. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, which is a favored tribe. He was also, the Bible says, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So out of all the Hebrews, he was a Hebrew. Of Hebrew. He, he was a Hebrew on both sides. And in regards to the law, Paul says that he was a Pharisee. So, you know, many of you, if, if you've studied the life of Paul, he was brought up by a scholar, you know, the basically the doctor of the law at that time where it's um, Gamaliel, right? And he was a scholar even about all the things that he learned. He learned all the things that the Jews were supposed to learn. So he was a very educated person. Even, in fact, he's the Bible saying that, uh, Paul was saying he was a Pharisee, which is the Pharisees at that time, they're the ones who are most uh, uh, strict in a observation of all the religious laws. So the Pharisees, he was a Pharisee. He's the one following all the rules. You know, even for zeal, he was saying, I was even a very passionate person. I was zealous because, you know, when he was, for whatever cause he was at that time, because he was, uh, for, for uh, he was even the one persecuting the, the Christians at that time because he was very zealous. He was a very passionate guy. In fact, he also said, as for righteousness, based on the law, he was faultless. So imagine even some of us, we have a hard time just following the speeding. <laughs> you know, the speed. You know, and we're just speeding. But Paul, imagine he was able to say, out of all these laws, you know, I was faultless. Yeah. So Paul wasn't just a regular average guy. You know, that's what he's saying here. He said, you know, out of all the people, out of all the things... You know, if, if you're looking for, in our time, we would look for an educated person. Yeah. And, you know, maybe if they're an educated person, I know many of us would say, wow, you know, if they say, wow, this person is a brain surgeon, you'd say, wow. You know, they probably studied for, you know, I don't know what happened to their brain. They, they, their brain probably exploded because they have so much information to know. <laughs> you know, we, we highly regard people of education. Yeah. You know, we highly regard people of position. 
So even, you know, even if they're a, a, a somebody of influence, so at that time, even nowadays, even we look up to pastors, we look up to leaders, uh, that's what who Paul was. He was a Pharisee. He was somebody who was very strict in observing the law, all the religious rules. He was there. He was a passionate guy. And so to an average person, you would look at Paul's life, and it was very admirable. So in our day, Paul would be somebody who's somebody we really look up to because of all of his qualifications. You know, just like I was saying, there's a brain surgeon or someone like that. And, you know, uh, the young people like to say, you know, that's goals, <laughs> right? Where, you know, in, in your life, you look up to someone because they have this, 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 the qualification. They met all these things. They have, they're educated. They're maybe, they're wealthy or they have all these things. And you look at them, oh, wow, they're even following the laws of the Lord. <laughs> you know, and you say, wow, that person is goals. <laughs> like the goals in my life. And, and they're hardly Paul was like that. He was somebody that you can really look up to. But it, what's amazing is when he describes his life, he's saying all of these things that everybody else would count as so admirable, as so respectful. I actually count that as garbage. Confusing. You say, I actually look at that and if all of these list of qualifications looks like garbage. It's rubbish. In fact, the the the, the, the word in in, uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, the original it, instead of garbage or uh, rubbish, there's other translations that even describe it as stool or dump. So it's not only something that's worthless, but it's something that has a negative connotation. Yeah. Which is confusing because every all of us would look at it and say, but that's amazing thing. Paul, why are you saying that that's not good? Because we would think that's really good. But he puts it in perspective here. He says, yeah, maybe these things to the rest of the world are awesome and good and great, but compared to knowing Christ, Amen. all of it is not even at all good. And it just shows us the value and the worth of who Jesus really is. Where we can look at everything that the world looks at as amazing because of Christ's word. I'm not saying that these things are horrible because I believe in careers. I believe that God uses, you know, education, that we should be people of, of, uh, people of influence. But what Paul is saying is these all, all these things compared to knowing Christ is worth nothing. I count all of this as lost, meaning that this is a value, but Christ's value is worth, it far supersedes anything that this world would have value in. It's that's how he felt when he was talking about knowing Christ. He, and as a result, because he saw Jesus Christ's worth, he was, he was very passionate and about knowing Jesus. He was very passionate about knowing Jesus. So this afternoon, you know, I've asked some questions where earlier where I talked about if you were to see God's worth in your life, Jesus' worth in life, where, well, how would you describe him? What would he be to you with everything you have in your life how does Christ, how would you describe Christ in your life? And, and let's look at today, you know, how, how valuable is Jesus in your life? Let's look at today some powerful truths that in this passage we can see about how Paul talked about his pursuit and passion of knowing Jesus and his worth. Firstly, for Paul, knowing Christ, he was passionate about knowing Christ because of his worth. So for Paul... You know, firstly, he, 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 he saw that he meant, uh, what he saw was knowing Christ meant knowing to be found in him. So verse 8 to 9, this is what the Bible says. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. All right, so he said, I am considering them garbage that I may gain Christ 
and be found in him. So I consider, so he's saying all these things I've lost and consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So I'm speaking very slowly just so you can catch this. It's a little bit hard to understand. But when you look at the, the words that Paul uses, you can see that for Paul, he talks about how he's lost all things and he's considered the things that other people would value as garbage and rubbish so that he would gain Christ. So it's showing us that he had to actually consider, he himself had to consider these things in his life as garbage so that he could gain Christ. So that he could be found in him. It shows us that Paul understands that to know Christ and gain Christ, that there's a real price. That there was a real cost, that there was a real consideration about the value and worth of things that other people saw in his own life. Compared to knowing the value of Christ. Paul knew that he couldn't gain and fully know Christ and be found in him without living his life differently. It was a posture of thinking. So he had to actually posture his thinking that I would actually see these things because all of us normally would see these things as awesome and great. But he had to posture his thinking to see these things as less, to give up those things so that he could gain Christ. And Paul knew that he couldn't gain Christ be found without living differently. See, see the verse 8. In fact, Paul says that for whose sake I actually lost all things. In the same way, we can learn from the example of Paul and what he talks about that to know Christ and be found in him, we too must be willing to posture our thinking and uh, value the things in our life and be willing to lose all things so that we can gain Christ. So that we can know him. In fact, let's look at Matthew 16, verse 24 to 25. Jesus even said this himself. So we won't be surprised. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Paul's passion See, to know Christ was encompassed in his desire to be found in Jesus and not in things of this world. So simply put, if we're to just summarize what the things that I'm just talking about right now, for Paul to know Christ, he knew that he needed to give up to gain. He needed to give up seeing everything with that much stature so that he could gain the understanding of word and worth of knowing Christ. He gave up what others saw would be important so that he could be gain and be gain and be found in the most important thing to him, which was Jesus. In the same way, we need to give up things of this world in order to gain Christ. And what does that look like for you and I today? What does what what things uh you know when, when we're talking about this? Well, maybe we can start by asking ourselves some honest questions. If we were to evaluate our life and make a statement like Paul did, how would we, how would our statement be? What, what would you say you're gaining right now? Aside from pounds, <laughs> maybe from all the barbecues right now. You know, what would you say, I'm just making a joke, but what would you, bringing it back to more serious, what would you say you're gaining Right now, is it your career, is it your education, or is it Christ? I'm not saying that those things are bad, like I said earlier before. But when you look at how your life is postured and how you're thinking, is your life postured that everything you would gain in life is all the things of this world? Or is your life postured that if I just gain Christ, Everything else doesn't matter. How are we postured? We can ask ourselves these real questions. Are we more passionate about gaining a name for ourselves or earning a high income or becoming successful and admirable in the eyes of the world if we can post our Facebook and say or our Instagram or all these things and, and show them all the things 
things that we have in our nice house with our nice backyard and our nice car and you know maybe our latest vacation yeah. are we so concerned and consumed with all of that stuff or are we can we can we be found in those things or can we be found in Christ are we most passionate to gain Christ, to know and be found in him? Paul shows us that we can't know more of Christ in our lives and be found in him if we're not willing to give up anything to get there. If we're so consumed with being part of, in the world and seeing those things of the most value, we cannot gain everything that Christ has for us. Because all these things, he's postured his thinking to begin to value this who God is more. And that's what we have to understand. If, if we're not able to give up the things of this world, we can't be found in Christ. Men, You know, it's, it just becomes very practical. Where are we giving up our own time? You, you know, if we, we don't give up our time to know God, you know, to read our Bible, to pray, um, to really know Jesus, then we, you can't expect to know him. If we put everything in, in our lives on maybe, you know, doing all the tasks, you know, we can spend a lot of time on Facebook and everything like that. Um, it's not it's not bad, but you can't expect to know Jesus if you're so consumed with all the things of this world. Man, if Paul continued living in the way that he was living, where he, you know, he was a, a man of reputation, he was a man of education, he was a scholar, if he, he just valued all of that and was living how he was living and just continued in that. He said, I was the one who was, you know, following all the religious laws. I was even a passionate guy. And if he continued just living that life, he wouldn't have found the value of Christ. You know, he, he, he wouldn't have found the value of Christ if, if he did not consider those things as lost to him. That Christ was actually worth pursuing and saying, see, he said, I, I consider it lost and I actually um, lost all things for his sake. Friends, knowing Christ was so valuable to him and he was prepared, Paul, uh, Paul's prepared to count the cost. But let me ask you this question, how much have you lost for the sake of knowing Christ? Does Christ take first place in your life? Or where, where Christ is first and everything else you would move around so that you would have time for him, so that you could know him more, so that you, know, you can go to your life group or so you can study his word or so you can pray. Would you move everything around so that he can be first? Or would you do everything else first and then try to squeeze him in there? With the five minutes that I want to say you know, maybe a quick, very quick prayer. <laughs> I'm not saying that you can't say quick prayers, but it's just to keep our, our life in perspective in every day. Who is our priority? What is our prayer? How much does Jesus really matter in our lives? Do we just fit him on the side? You know, many of us, I know the reality of North American life that we can get very busy, busy very easily. But are we busy knowing Jesus? Or are we busy doing other things? Sometimes we simply add routines or even, um, uh, I'll talk about this later, but we, we add routines to our lives and we think that those routines are, are, are the things that make us, are, are the, the only things that when we do those, we actually know Christ, but we don't. For example, if we just come here and then go out, we think we know Christ more. Yes, they help us know Christ more, but if we just come here and sleep and then go, go back, it doesn't change anything, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later, but it's, 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 a, it's important to see that Paul said everything is worth losing so that just so that he could gain Christ. Would you be so bold to say a statement like that? Where you could say, if I asked you and you were to make a statement here today and we were to record it, would you be able to say like Paul that everything in my life is worth nothing compared to Jesus, how, how much I love Jesus, compared to how much I follow him, compared to how much I serve him, compared to how much he's impacting my life. You know, these things are good and important. Maybe I go to school, maybe I go to my workplace, maybe you know, I, you know I'm, I'm spending time with my family. And, you know, but at the end of the day, and each and every day, the beginning of the day, I just need Jesus so much in my life.
my life. That if, even if I lost anything, even if other things were to disappear, I would be content because I know that God's who Jesus in my life far supersedes anything else. That we would count any achievement in this world as even lost compared to knowing Christ. Friends, we need to intentionally give up finding ourselves in other things so that we can be found in Christ. So that we could, you know, be, be, be found in who he is. Maybe we've attained things throughout the, the years just like Paul. But the question is, how much do you value Christ? How much do you want to know? Paul is passionate to say, I want to know Christ because he's worth so much that even every achievement I've had, it's worth nothing. It's a big statement because when you have achievement, it's something we all applaud, you know? It's something that, you know, of course you want to boast in. You want to say, that's awesome. Wow, it was so hard. So many years of school or so many, you know, things that you worked for your position in your job. You know, you had to wait how many years to get promoted and all these things. And now you maybe you're the manager, you're the supervisor, you're the lead person in that your team. And, and it's an achievement that you've earned. But you, would you be willing to say that all of these achievements in my life are actually worth nothing compared to Jesus? Friends, in order to gain Christ, we need to give up seeing everything else with so much value. It is worth something, but we need to put Christ in higher value. Amen? So that we can be passionate to know him. Of course, if these things are very are good to you and worth so much to you, you're passionate. You'll drive, you'll do all these things so you can go there. You know, if, if for school, you're never late. You know, you always attend every class. You submit all your things. For work, you never miss. You know, you're always in and out. You're, you're, you're even early when you clock in and when you clock out. You, you're, you never miss a day. You know, you, don't, you never even want to take off. <laughs> you know, you're even overtime all the time. And, and if, 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 if that's your passion, if that's the thing that worth, is worth so much to you, of course you'll do everything so that you can do that. But if friends, we, we, we know Christ, and if we have a passion to know Christ, then everything we'll do to know him. If we see God as the value yes. and over all these things, that we'll do everything so we can know him. Just like that's what Paul said. Amen. We can be found in Christ. The second thing is Paul was also passionate about knowing Christ in his life. And to him, that meant knowing God's faithfulness in accordance with righteousness. So it meant knowing faithfulness. So what he was talking in here, let's look at verse, I'll explain it, but let's look at verse 9. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Then I'm going to read another translation of this same passage. You don't have it up there, but it's the NET version. And this is what it says, the same verse. And be found in him, not because I have my own righteousness derived from the law, but because I have the righteousness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness, a righteousness from God that is in fact based on Christ's faithfulness. So, you know, Paul is talking here about how when he wanted to know Christ and be found in him, and that meant attaining, not, it meant that it wasn't attaining righteousness through the law, but it was actually attaining righteousness because God was faithful in his life. It was God's faithfulness, that's why he could have righteousness. So knowing Christ to him wasn't about just doing all the observances of being religious, but it wasn't all the things that, it wasn't all the things he could do, but it was actually understanding God's faithfulness. That God was faithful to him, that he was the one who clothed him with righteousness, that when he put his faith in Jesus, and, and had his faith in him, that's the righteousness that he, what was come over life, which empowers him to know Christ in a deeper way. It wasn't, you know, Paul goes to talk about them that it wasn't based, you know, our righteousness is not based on, on, on our faithfulness, but it's on God's faithfulness. So being found in Christ is not a matter of what we can do, 
but of God's grace, his faithfulness, and our faith in him. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. See, friends, it's important for us to realize that this is what Paul was passionate about. He was passionate that he, he realized that in, in knowing Jesus more, it wasn't about anything that he could do. In, in desiring to know, that's the context he was bringing. So, you know, in the verses that he's talking about, he's talking, you know, all these things I consider lost. But then he starts saying all these things about righteousness. And he starts saying that, you know, it wasn't a righteousness that's achieved by the law, but it was the righteousness in, uh, uh, with my faith in Christ that I've, I've, I've had in my life. Meaning that we can't earn our righteousness just by following. We can't know Christ just by following all the rules. Right? Then we, we don't know Christ just because we, this is what I was saying, we're going to talk about it right now, is that, you know, knowing Christ and, you know, being found in Him, to Paul, that didn't mean list of A, B, C, D, D, E, F, G. That's what his old life was. Yeah. But he was saying knowing Christ now and being found in Him was not A, B, C, D, D. It was actually knowing Christ and applying His grace and having faith in Him. And, and, and it's important for us to contextualize this because many of us, we come in the situation and we come here and we think, just like I was talking earlier, we come in and we think by following A, B, C, D, E, F, G, of, you know, coming to life group, or, you know, if I raise my hands or if I do that, those things are good because maybe it's an outflow of our heart and expression of our faith. But if we think that coming to just inside here every single Sunday and just attending life group, you know, back and forth, or, you know, just doing this and that, or if I, you know, just quickly glance my Bible for, you know, five minutes a day, then I know Christ. Paul saying no. That is part of our Christian life and our faith because we want to know Christ, but it's not backwards. It's not we do all these things and then all of, all of a sudden we know Christ. You know, that's the only way to know Christ. Paul saying, actually, when we receive, when we believe in him, we receive the righteousness that comes through faith, which empowers us to know him. And from there, there's an inner work in our lives that it changes the way we live our life. That everything comes out of an outflow. That's why they say that, you know, even when we're, we're talking about being internally governed, is, is it, you know, it's not just an external rules where we have to change A, B, C, and D. And then we're Christian. Knowing Christ to him, knowing Christ to Paul meant that it was an inner work in his life. That he said, I really believe in Jesus. I know Jesus for myself and, and I have faith in him. And that's why I'm changing that. That's why even if I did, I used to be the life of A, B, C, and D. And that has not achieved for me anything. I count the A, B, C, D, E as loss. Compared to actually knowing Christ. And his righteousness. Because he's the one who's faithful. No matter what I do with A, B, C, and D, he's the one who's faithful. Even no matter what I do. And that's part of knowing Christ is that even Isaiah, you know, talks about how our seemingly righteous acts, you know, outside of Christ are like filthy rats. It's meaningless to God if it's not really true to why, you know, it's not an expression of our faith. We're trying to earn something, then it's not, it's not, it's like filthy rags to God. You know, have you met people that are, are self-righteous? Where they think that they know everything, or if they have all this knowledge, and they do all these things that, you know, I come here, and I go out, and then I, you know, uh, you know, I did all the ABCD, meaning, you know, maybe I've come every Sunday, I've never missed a Sunday. <laughs> you know, I've never been, I have perfect attendance. And then, you know, my, I, I always give my offering and do all these things. Not saying those are bad. That's an expression of our faith. But if we think that that's what it's all about, Paul is saying no. He's saying knowing Christ is not just a list of things to do. It's not just our right. It's not just righteousness outwardly. You know, it's not just religious acts where we can think, okay, I, you know, I know this, so, you know, because I memorized this verse and I can quote it, that I know Christ. It really hasn't been an inter a work inside of us where we demonstrated already. 
Where it's, you know, not just the outward righteousness that we produce, but it's having faith in Jesus where he closes with righteousness, where it's changed our lives and people see it. You know, I even, even when I, in my co one of my, even my coworkers, he knows I'm a, a Christian and um, he's of, uh, I believe, the Catholic faith. And he was talking to me and he's saying, you know what, Michelle, sometimes I'm so discouraged because I see, you know, people from my congregation and they go in and, you know, they are worshiping. They're, they're even part of that, the worship team. And then when they go outside, they're cursing in the parking lot. You know, and they're, they're already doing this. And, you know, so they do all the things. They're very faithful when it comes to the observances of the religious laws. But it has not done anything. They don't know Jesus because I don't see it. So there was, that's what he was saying to me. And I said, you know, um, that's why you should go to Champion Life. <laughs> Where Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He's not just our Savior, but he's our Lord. Where he, he changes us. But this is the friends, this is the truth. This is what Paul's saying. That it's not just the things that we do on the outside. It's not just the, our, our head knowledge of scripture. It's not, that's important. But our faith in Christ, knowing Christ, it's not a list of things to do. It's really knowing and applying it. Applying. It's by faith. I received him by faith. That's why I'm righteous because of him. Amen. You know, it's not just by service or, or all these things. He's saying, uh, Paul, and that's why Paul saw so much worth in Jesus. Because it was freeing him. <laughs> and he said, wow, you know, this is, this is who Jesus is. I count him when I receive Jesus in my life, even internally, and he changed my life. That's true right. I received true righteousness. And there's an internal work in him. And, you know, because the reality is that we will never be good enough. The reality is that we would never complete the list for us to know God if that was how he would do things. But, and that's why it's not about that. Knowing Christ, we have the passion to know Christ. It shouldn't just be our zealousness for the religious activities. You know, we must count Christ worth everything. That, you know, uh, of course we would do these things. So don't get me wrong. Don't, don't say to your life group leader, Michelle said we don't need to attend life group anymore. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing those things. No, that is not what I'm saying. That's an expression of our faith when we have that drug saying that you don't do those things to just earn Christ's righteousness. Because you will always fail. But we have to receive Christ and his righteousness because he's faithful. It's not, as what Paul said, he, it was by his faithfulness. That's why we can receive that. It was because he's faithful, not because we're faithful. Because he's faithful that we can know him. Amen? And that's why it's really we want to experience Christ and his true righteousness through his faithfulness. No, the third thing, or lastly, uh, one of the things that we can see in this passage is that Paul also had a passion to know Christ, um, which also meant for him knowing his resurrection power. But what's interesting is, let's look at verse 10. I want to know Christ, yes. To know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Friends, it's interesting to hear Paul talk about this. He's, you know, he's, it makes sense for us to say, yes, I want to know his resurrection power. You know, we might sing res power after that, if you know that song. You know, I want to know Christ's resurrection power. But then if you see the verse, not only does Paul say his resurrection power, but he also expressed his desire to know Christ's sufferings and become like Jesus in his death. Isn't that interesting? The reason being is that Paul understood that without the suffering of Jesus, there was no resurrection power. So when he was passionate to know God's resurrection power, that means he was actually also passionate to know God, Jesus' sufferings. Because he knew that in order, if you can even see it in Jesus' life, the reality is that before we even saw Jesus' resurrection, there was death and suffering on the cross. Likewise, that's why, you know, we want to be like Paul and, and, and know that knowing Christ is understanding God's resurrection power that comes through sacrifice. So knowing Christ in that way is that you, you also know his sacrifice. You also know that you're passionate about, that passionate about knowing Christ, that you're willing to sacrifice. That you're willing, you know, just like Paul, he was so passionate. He wanted to know God's resurrection power to the point that he said, I want to know your resurrection power. Even be, and because I want to know that power, that means I also want to know that suffering. I want to be like Christ. I want to know his death. Oh, that's so heavy. <laughs> He's saying, I want to know suffering. No, I don't 
upside down, right? It's always an up. Everything that you know we would think is comfortable and good for us, God's God does opposite. He's saying, uh, and Paul's saying that actually I'm so passionate about knowing God's resurrection and who God is that I actually am willing, and His worth is so much, and I'm willing to know His suffering. I'm willing to know His 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 death. You know, many of us want always the resurrection power, and we don't realize that it also comes sometimes with death and suffering. Most of us think that following Christ and knowing Jesus is all easy. But I know many of you who have been Christian for a long time already can, can agree with me that that's not exactly true. And it's not easy. And Paul makes this very clear that he says, I want to know Jesus' resurrection power and his suffering. That there is really something that's sometimes there's things that in our lives that we suffer. Because we live in a fallen and dark world and you know, we don't want the difficult part, but that's the reality that following Jesus is not always easy. We, if we want to see God's value, that's how much he, he, uh, Christ was valuable to him, that word that, to the point where he was willing to go through suffering. You know, that's what the Bible says, is that if we want to find life, that resurrection power, if we want to experience that, what God is talking about, then we need to even be willing to go to the point of death and even suffer through things just like Jesus where he endured the cross so that we can experience life in him. It could look like even dying to ourselves um, or, or death to ourselves or our own way. So I don't really, I don't mean that you're going to go outside and, you know, kill yourself. Not like that. I don't mean that. I mean that, you know, dying to our ways and even sometimes the things in our life that need to die. That is our way, maybe the world's way. That we need, and sometimes it's suffering when the things that we want or we want to do, and it's a, different from God's way, and God wants to kill it in our lives. God wants us to, to remove that from our lives, and it hurts, and it, it feels like suffering. Where the things that, you know, everybody else, like Jesus, he, was, he, he suffered and he endured, but that was the thing that was giving us eternal life. So the things that sometimes we suffer through, God uses it. That would give, it would give us life. Let's look at Galatians 2, verse 20. This is what the Bible says. For I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, the Bible says, it talks about being crucified with Christ. That's like suffering with him. To the point that we no longer live, but that Christ lives in us. That it's coming, he comes alive, and that's having the resurrection power through Jesus. You know, friends, we have to realize that to have his resurrection power, to have his power, that sometimes requires us to die to ourselves and allow Jesus to live in us. If we want to know Christ and his power, we need to see that it also sometimes causes with a great sacrifice. The sacrifice might be great in the eyes of others. So it might be things that would be great in the eyes of others where it's our worldly life or our possessions or our achievements. But the promise is that when we give them up, when we sacrifice, even when we suffer through things, we truly come alive. That's our opportunity where, you know, the Bible talks about we gotta die before we come alive. You know, I was sharing this this morning that even in, you know, everyday life, myself, you know, we, you know, we have things in our lives that we get very frustrated or, you know, something happens and you, you, you might, you know, our temper rises up or, you know, you, 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 you feel like you don't want to do this or you do that or somebody's coming to you. It's like you have no patience anymore. You just want to act in anger, right? And those are the things that God wants to kill in us so that we can truly live in Him. And we can demonstrate Him. And we can have that life and the power of God flowing through our lives. You know, how can we demonstrate Him? We always talk about this. How can we demonstrate Him if that's not His character and His nature? So He's saying, the life I'm living, the life of who I am in this world, I must cut it off so that I can have Christ. And that's how much He saw God's value in His life. That he saw life in Christ is the most amazing thing. That when I see Jesus and his life, that he can work resurrection power inside of me and that I can live for him. That means that it means that sometimes it costs me to die. It costs me to, to cut off the things that are in my life. And maybe it sometimes causes me to endure 
suffering in my life. Or maybe there's things that you're going through today or you have gone through that have taught you things in, 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 in knowing Christ. That has taught you patience. That has taught you perseverance. Just like Jesus. You know, there was things that he endured. But it was the joy that was set before him, the Bible said. And that's what we have to see, even in, in our suffering, that we can see with new eyes and see that the things that we're suffering in, in, in uh, life in Christ is at the end of it, then it's worth it. And Christ is worth it. And that's why Paul was saying, I'm actually willing to know Jesus' suffering. Because I know that in his suffering, if I, sometimes if I experience suffering, I actually can, on the other end of it, I, can, I will experience his resurrection power. I will experience new life in him. If I die to myself, I can now live fully in Christ. Because sometimes our way and God's way is not the same way. And if we want to live in Christ in his ways, then it means us dying to our own way. In our own flesh. That's what the Bible says. Amen? Amen? That we want to, so we can't know more of Jesus and gain more of him and see this power if we're not willing to also suffer with him or to enjoy hardship or even to enjoy, uh, die to ourselves. So friends, you know, I want to challenge you, each and every one of you today. How much is knowing Jesus worth it to you? How much is Jesus worth it to you? Do you have a genuine passion to know Christ and to continue to know him? Do you have a passion to be found in him? Do you have a passion to know his faithfulness and experience the righteousness that comes from knowing him? Yes. Do you have a passion to know him and, and his resurrection power to experience life fully in him even if it costs something? Even if it's through things that we experience that are not good. We can clearly see it if we're willing to count everything, even our achievements and our, our the things that the world would value or what we would value as loss, that we can have the opportunity to be found in Him. You know, are we truly living in this reality where we have applied His righteousness to our lives, that we're not just trying to achieve a good status, or observe external rules and outward regulations. But we're, we're come to the point where we're so passionate about knowing Christ that we'll even want to experience his suffering. It's a question and a challenge to us. Paul found Jesus so worth everything. This is the context that he was talking about this. He was saying that this is how much God is worth. I'm saying all these things. And I'm saying about everything about, you know, where, where you know, all of my achievements are worth nothing. Even all, you know, all the religious acts are, are nothing. You know, all, all, even suffering is nothing. I want to experience that too because knowing Jesus is my greatest passion. His value in my life is the greatest thing ever. And I, yes, I want to know him. Is that truly the desire of our hearts? Is that truly where we are at? Because at the end of the day, you know, friends, everything else, you know, our achievements, our, you know, everything else in this world is temporal. It can fail. It just puts things in perspective for us. One day you can have a successful career, the next day you can be laid off it just like that. You know, one day you can have the all the, uh, you know, honor roll, and then this one thing happens, and you miss your grade, and all of a sudden you're failing. I'm not declaring that, though. I'm champions in Jesus' name. But I'm just saying, you know, one time you can have a, you know, your salary is this much, then all of a sudden it's recession, and boom. You know, one day you can have the build the best house, the best backyard, and a disaster can come, and it's nothing. And it's a measure to us, what are we truly finding value in? How much is Christ worth in your life? How much are other things worth in your life? If we want Christ in our life, we want to know him. Let us be passionate about putting, putting a higher value 
in knowing Christ than, than pursuing other things. You can pursue other things, but don't squeeze Jesus in. Paul's saying, in fact, I would consider everything as garbage and loss because Christ is so worth it. so, so much more than everything in this world can fill. You could take all of these things away, but if I can know Christ and his resurrection power, I even worth, I even would love, go through his suffering just so I can know him and know his power and become alive in him. Amen? And I want to encourage you today, if that's you, or if you're, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, you're like me and feeling very challenged. Because it's a very challenging word. But I want to encourage you with what Paul says in verses 12 to 14. This is what Paul says. He says, not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I for forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Friends, maybe like if you're like me, we're still on our way. But it starts with our desire to know Christ and value Him in our lives at the most. To put Him at the highest worth in our lives. Let's forget, be, let's be like Paul and let's forget whatever was in the past. Maybe, you, you know, we've done that in, in our lives. But let's be like Paul and say, you know what, today is the day. Now is the time where, you know, I really want to build my hope and my anchor. I want Christ to be my cornerstone. I want Christ to be my everything. If I, if Michelle were to ask, if someone were to ask me of a statement about how much Christ is worth, I can easily say, it, everything is worth nothing to me if I just have Christ. Let's have that as the desire and the prayer of our heart. Let's press on so that we can desire to know Christ. That we'll always be excited to, to know him, to, to learn about him, to have a passion just like Paul. Amen? Let's, uh, let's just pray and bow our heads in, and I'm going to call the worship team. Father God, we just thank you for this time where we can know you. God, I thank you that you're uh, putting alarm in our, in our hearts. That Lord, in such a time as this, that you're calling us to know you. You're calling us to know you deeper and deeper, that we would have a passion to truly have you in our lives. God, I pray for every heart and every mind. Lord, as you're working in every heart, God, yield us to your plan, that there would be no pride in our heart, that, Lord, we would really humble ourselves, that we could really truly know you in even a deeper way today, that, Lord, we would press on towards the goal of knowing you. I'll work in our lives and have your way. Um, change us, even mold us so that we can be more like your son. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.